Hey everybody, it's me, it's your old buddy Steve Simonson, and I'm coming back again with another AwesomeMerch.com podcast episode. And today we're at number 173, everybody. So all you have to do is go to AwesomeMerch.com slash 173, and you'll find some show notes, details, maybe even a link or two. Uh, and th this is going to be an important reason to go to that website because I've got a special guest with me today. John Lee joins me. John, say hello. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Certainly my pleasure. Now, John, you uh, are one of the key leaders over there at PickFu. Uh, what, what's your exact position over there? Uh, I'm one of the founders of PickFu. So PickFu, as I understand it, helps deliver what, what you guys call the power of instant market feedback for right. a really inexpensive and simple process. Can you give us the elevator pitch on PickFu real quick? Sure thing. So PickFu is basically a digital focus group that's really, really fast. So we have a panel of um, thousands of online consumers, you all US based, and our users come to our panel and ask them quick questions uh, about their business, about their business decisions. So if, for example, if you're selling on e-commerce, you can come in and try to fit, if you're trying to figure out which best main image to use for your product listing, you can come to PickFu, post a poll and say, um, which image or which product would you purchase and why? And our panelists will quickly answer that uh, and not only vote, but also write down their explanations. So you get both the qualitative and the quantitative feedback. Uh, and usually all of this happens within a matter of minutes, like 50 responses in 15 minutes. Oh, boy, I tell you, we are living in the salad days of information, everybody, because yes. this is, this is uh, an unprecedented opportunity. And the precision and the amount of data, we're going to dive into several concepts. And I'm going to ask some questions about, you know, use cases and so forth to John. Uh, but before we do that, John, I kind of, I always like to know, you know, kind of a little bit of the background, a little bit of the origin story. So, so tell us where you came from and, and a little bit about you and, and how the PickFu story got uh, set up. Sure. So PickFu was actually, it did not start as a main project. It was actually a side project and a tool that my co-founder, Justin, and I built for ourselves. So my co-founder and I, we both used to work at large tech companies. I was actually up in Microsoft in Seattle. I think somewhere close to where you are. Yeah, yeah, I'm very close. Believe yeah, me, Microsoft, yeah, they, they're listening in. All my neighbors oh, are like, totally, totally. Yeah, so uh, I did my stint there and... Um, my friend, my uh, co-founder, Justin, and I had always wanted to start a business together. So at some point, we decided to just take the plunge, quit our corporate jobs, and just, you know, gave notice and started our own business. Now, that original business was actually a restaurant listing site. This was over a decade ago. And it was just the two of us. You know, it was the classic work from a garage, work from everything, just spend 80 hours a week working and building that site up. And along the way, we realized, hey, we really have, uh, our backgrounds are all in development, so we have no, we really have very little design sense, and we had these battles about design decisions, which logo to use, which, uh, which color to use for this page layout, what should the page layout be? So we would always be having these debates, and our friends and family were just really tired, <laughs> you know, uh, of us, uh, you know, we always had this inner circle where you, you meet, when you start a business, you lean on your friends and family, you're like, hey, what do you think about this idea, or what do you think about this logo, or what do you think about this? And they were just really getting sick of it. So, so one day, just on a whim, um, you know, what, what do two developers do to try to settle debates? They build a separate feedback platform, right? Like, <laughs> obviously, obviously, that's obviously that's the right. That's thing the to most do. logical so, step for everybody. The most logical step for us in the development um, world. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we built this sort of minimum viable product, just really ugly looking thing, um, but it got feedback, unbiased feedback for us, really, really fast. So that was many, many years ago. We just used it for ourselves. We put it in some um, startup forums, didn't touch it for years. And along the way, you know, as we were trying to build this, uh, grow this other business, this pick food thing just, you know, it kept, it kept growing organically and people spread the word and people kept talking about it. And at some point when we were getting kind of tired and looking to move on from this other business, we, we turned around and saw pick food and like, hey, we're providing value for people. Um, it's growing organically, it's spreading by word of mouth. There's really, you know, maybe there's something here. Maybe the business is not here, but over here. Um, so that's when we turned our attention to pick food. So that was probably four or five years ago, and we've just been growing it ever since. I love the, uh, any kind of background or origin story that involves the, well, I wasn't actually intending to do this, but right. by happenstance, the, the uh, you know, twist of uh, the world uh, made it happen. And so, 
this, by the way, you share that kind of uh, legacy with many, many famous companies, everybody from Firestone to, you know, up and down the line of, you know, kind of unintended consequences being right. awesome. So that, that's really neat. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, you guys are coders and kind of come from that development background. And so it was natural for you to, to, you know, try to build something. Right. The fact is you built something to help you make decisions. Now, I wonder if you'll agree with me on this, John. I think some of the, the least qualified people to make decisions about logos and marketing slogans and, and all that are the founders of the business because they're too close mm -hmm. and the family of the business because they really, they have no idea. They're out of their depth and they're bored out of their minds and even over abused like uh, in your case. Yeah, and bias too. Yeah, bias. Totally. So, no. so we'll, maybe we'll talk about confirmation bias here a little bit. Let's Because founders in particular are, I think, subject to confirmation bias. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah. I mean, founders, like you said, they're just way too close to, to the decision. And even, um, yeah, like when you're, when you're trying to make a decision, if you're, if you're a founder and you're trying to, let's say, come up with a logo for your company or a name for your company, every single thing that you come up with is going to be your baby. So you can't, it's going to be so hard for you to have, a, um, have an unbiased view of, of how the market is going to react. It's because it's really not when you're, when you're building a business, it's not really about how, how much you care about your logo or how much you care about your decisions. It's how the market's going to react to your decisions. So it's, it makes a lot more sense in my mind to get the feedback from them, from actual people in the market versus your friends and family or anyone else who might have a close relationship with you and doesn't really want to hurt your feelings. Yeah, feelings are the worst. Uh, so, you know, let's let's not kid ourselves. Uh, for all the awesomers out there, when you have that idea, as as John said, it, they're little baby ideas, right? And you got all these little baby ideas running around. And so, confirmation bias is is kind of your attempt to validate the idea yeah. without regard whether or not the idea on its face is good or not, right? We we don't start with is this a good idea. We start with prove me to me that this is a good idea. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, you're asking the wrong question already, right? You're not even asking whether it's a good idea or not. You're, you're, you're asking the market to say, how good is this idea? How good is this idea? And that's, that's not necessarily helpful. That's, yeah. And again, as we start to think about, all right, so we get out of the ethereal you know, confirmation bias or let's not indulge our own preferences and so forth. But there are real economic reasons why this matters. Uh, you want to talk about that for a minute, John? For sure. So uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, one of one of the uh, large category of customers that use Picfu are authors, um, self published. Like if you're writing a book or something, you know, self publishing authors come to Picfu to test their book titles and their book covers before publishing, because once you put it out there, you can't really take it back, right? And we have had uh, we have had authors who have come on who've uh, been shocked at the results that they've. Uh, gotten on PicFu because they were completely, they were enamored with a certain book title or a certain book cover, and then our, you know, the unbiased audience chose the other one in an overwhelming fashion, and they were shocked. Or there will be authors who will have debates with their publishers to say, "Hey, I want this book title, this book cover," um, and usually PicFu is pretty good at settling debates between, like in our case, between different co-founders and so on. So we've definitely had a number of different um, authors who've actually made it on. We've had some New York Times bestsellers who've actually chosen their book titles and their, sorry, their book covers based on a bunch of polls using the Big Foo audience. And so they've, they've gone on to great success with that. I love that. That's a very good uh, example. And if you're, you know, authors, obviously that's a very clear example. Test book covers, test titles. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're in e-commerce, Test product images, test, uh, you know, the, the titles, perhaps. Uh, there, there's probably lots of different ways. E-commerce, guys, uh, what are some use cases, John, for e-com folks uh, trying to for figure sure. out? E-commerce uh, e is one of our biggest verticals because uh, Picfu is able to make a really big impact on e-commerce businesses. So the, the thing that we're probably most known for in e-commerce is uh, split testing your main images. Uh, you can test anywhere between two to eight image options with our audience in a matter of minutes, people will vote and they'll tell you why. And so we've seen results where sellers have run a pick food test, used the winner, put it, uh, went on to say Amazon, changed their listing to the winning one and doubled or tripled their sales. So that's just the base use case. But what we've been discovering as more and more sellers have been using PicFu is that 
the earlier on in the process, in the product development process that you use PicFu or generally gather feedback, the more impactful that feedback and uh, can be on your business decisions. So for example, um, if you're in product sourcing, we've actually seen a lot of sellers use PicFu to help determine literally which product to sell. If you're selling a tea kettle and you're trying to talk to, and you're talking to a couple of different potential vendors in China or anywhere else, they'll probably send you images of, hey, this is a tea kettle we offer, this is a tea kettle we offer, this is a tea kettle we offer. Well, the smart sellers are going on to PicFu and putting all those up for maybe 50 bucks or 100 bucks to run a poll to really understand what the audience is going to react to before they even put in like a purchase order or sign any kind of contract. And so that way they're able to reduce the risk in their business earlier on in the process and get a better chance of product success further down the line. Well, I tell you, this is uh, near and dear to my heart because <laughs> first of all, the, the, I love the uh, point about, you know, being farther upstream, right? It, when you're at the end of the equation, there's, there's less math to be done, but when right. you're, as I like to think of it, you know, when you launch a product, you're launching a rocket ship. And if you're one degree off, that rocket ship is in another galaxy, unintended galaxy. Whereas if you get it tight and tight, uh, it's, it's better. So I definitely would recommend people, especially when you don't know yourself, maybe it's the color, the style, the whatever you, you've got the vertical nailed down, but you don't know the precise details right. and you haven't made that final selection. Why not spend a couple hundred bucks? Because it's tens of thousands potentially to launch that product. Right. And that one decision could make a, a huge difference. So uh, John, I mean, I'm very intrigued by this. So what does it take for somebody to launch, you know, a PicFu market feedback? It sounds complicated to the outsiders, right? They're like, Oh my gosh, you know, market research. Oh, this is going to take a while. And, and they get nervous. So tell right. us, uh, is it easy? Is it hard? What, what's it's up? Super easy. So that's uh, before we built PicFu, we always had that view of market research that we thought that market research was this crazy pie in the sky thing where you needed to be like a Procter and Gamble with a multi-million dollar market research arm and you're going to spend weeks building out surveys and stuff. So we, we built PicFu for ourselves to make it as fast as possible to get market feedback. So what that means is you, it literally takes one minute to set up a poll. You just go on, write one question, provide anywhere between one to eight options, and then you choose your audience because we allow you to target by different demographics and then you hit publish and that's it. And instantly we're, we publish that out to our panel, people start answering first come first serve and you'll start seeing, you'll start seeing responses come in immediately. That is amazing. I love the kind of frictionless world that we live in, right? They, they say information is power and this is the ultimate kind of information because it's all, it's a predictive indicator of uh, success. And that, that's really, really amazing. Yeah, one of the uh, neatest things that we've heard from our clients is uh, there's a segment of clients who are actually consultants, like let's say uh, market con uh, marketing consultants or design consultants. And what they'll do is they'll actually start in a client meeting, they'll, they'll have done the work for the client. They'll start a pick food poll comparing the, let's say they're redesigning a website. They'll start a, they'll start a pick food poll at the beginning of their client meeting with the current website and then their new work and literally publish that and have it run and they'll walk through and 15 minutes later they'll come back and they'll you know obviously their work they probably may have tested this before but obviously their work is more preferred and you can see a lot of the different audience responses and the clients are usually like blown away they're like wow you're a genius you know uh, you oh, that is a clever use case right there i would definitely say you probably want to run a little pre-test uh, before you go in and sure. uh, reveal on that but i i do love that kind of live in fact I, i've got a couple ideas for a couple of the guys i run around with where I could do that because sometimes talking them out of their own ideas, even yes. if the ideas are destructive is a waste of time and it's just a waste of energy. And like even in a case where I have no financial incentive, it's like that is the dumbest thing I ever heard right. from the outside. I can see it clearly from the inside there, that confirmation bias, the whole thing, they're so invested, but yeah. uh, that's a very clever uh, idea. Uh, you know, John, I'll tell you a quick story. One time, uh, mm -hmm. more than one time, but at one time I remember specifically, we were doing a website redesign. And because things like PicFu didn't exist and even Google surveys and things like that were not yet mm -hmm. available, our only way of doing it was to kind of run an A-B on our website, right? So mm -hmm. we were running the add to cart button basically in a different spot in a different color. And so we're spending you know, $2, $3 a click to drive people into the website. And then we're live testing on these folks. And it's, it's insanely expensive 
to yes. do that sort of thing. Whereas yes. it strikes me that you could just do that on PicFu and, and maybe at a, a more quick rate, therefore less costly, and maybe even a, a lower rate than several dollars a click. I don't know what the rates run, but it was really expensive to drive that traffic only yeah. to get our answer later, which by the way was massively meaningful. It, that over the course of years made us extra millions of dollars. So we need right. to make the change. Yeah, so we, uh, the pricing for PeakFu starts at a dollar per response. Uh, we pay our respondents um, and then they come and they're able to not only choose and write uh, and give written feedback. So you understand sort of the why behind their decision. Um, their split, live split testing definitely, like you said, it definitely has a place in uh, conversion optimization. Um, there are there are pros and cons to both, and I know that at, the, at least in the Amazon space, uh, some sellers are a little you know a little weary, um, cautious of wanting to test live negative images because anytime you're A/B testing, you know you there's one that's performing worse than the other, and they don't really want to give those signals to to the algorithm, the Amazon's algorithm to maybe drive down the search rankings or something or jeopardize live sales. So that's one of the benefits that at least sellers. Uh, um, that e-commerce sellers have told us is that it's off Amazon, it's off Shopify, it's off whatever, that they can just get this sort of private feedback room before they're able to go back and, and apply uh, these changes to, the real, uh, to their stores. So I really love the idea that not only do they make a um, selection about the image or the copy or the whatever, that is just yeah. kind of a binary, I pick this over this or this over those, but they also leave some sort of notes. Can you talk about that? Because that seems to be one of the very most unique things about your offering. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty unique thing for us is that, and most people actually find that the written explanations are actually more valuable than the votes themselves. Um, because let's say, for example, you're choosing, um, you're choosing, let's go back to the tea kettle example, where you're choosing between two different tea kettles to, to stock, and one has a certain shape, one has a certain shape, and A, a has a certain shape, and B has a certain shape. And it, the poll comes back in a tie. Let's say you're, t you're pulling a hundred, uh, we'll do some sample targeting, hundred Amazon Prime females making over a hundred, hundred thousand dollars a year, which is something that we can do on PigFu. So you, you pull a hundred of them, it comes back 50-50 tie. Now, if all you had were the votes, you got, you know, then maybe that test is inconclusive. But if you actually start reading into the comments and we provide filtering for you to read every single comment and group by words and so on, you can, you can start seeing trends in the comments of saying, oh, well, the people who liked this option, maybe they liked it for the shape, and the people who liked this option, maybe they liked it for the color. So now you have that insight into to be able to go on and iterate to the next step. Um, now, another example of, those, of using those responses to uh, add a lot of value is when you're testing, when you, when you don't have two things to test, but it's just one thing. So we have this thing where you're literally just asking the audience to provide open-ended feedback. So one of the most interesting use cases for sellers that we've seen recently is that they will pose a question, they will put a link to their listing and say, take a look at this listing, what, after reviewing it, what other questions do you have about the product? So basically what you're doing is you're, get, you're pulling your audience and get, getting a whole bunch of potential buyers um, to look at your listing and bubble up all these questions that you may not have thought about, right? Like, does the tea, let's say in the tea kettle, does it get hot on the outside? Is it insulated? Is it glass? Is it made of plastic? There's all these things that uh, can help you fill in holes in your listing uh, that you may not have otherwise thought of. Boy, I tell you, it, it just, it's so intriguing and there's so many ways you can use this. I'll give you another example uh, for the awesomers out there and John. Uh, I remember we brought on a new product. Uh, this was years ago and it was, it had the a uh, high high apparent value and but we're saying to ourselves you know what we're going to we're going to make this a low price because we okay. want to really sell the heck out of it and and deliver the volume so we've got this product we put it out there high apparent value very low price and the thing just would not sell it would hmm. not sell and mm -hmm. this is again before we had uh, access to all these beautiful digital tools yeah. And so we would just ask the customers, you know, after showing them product A, product B, this is in a showroom environment, by the way, and we would, they would make their choice and A was the, the big, fat, heavy, beautiful one and B was like, yeah, it's fine, but it's not, not the big one, not the high apparent value and the low price. And by the way, we made more on the B, not on the A. Huh. Everybody kept picking the B. 
And so we, we asked them, you know, after they made the purchase, we said, you know, what was your key differentiator between A and B? And they're like, well, you know, how could the, uh, how good could the other one be? It was so cheap. Right. And so mm. our, our bias was let's give them a great deal. They'll, they'll just, right. they'll love us eternally for this great deal. We raised the price and we sold triple the amount. <laughs> right. So there's lots of ways that our brain as entrepreneurs and founders and, and operators of businesses, we get ourselves twisted and we, we put mm -hmm. all of these layers in that we think, and we have good instincts. I'm not going to lie, yeah. but there's too many times where a little twist would make a difference. Have you ever heard of uh, that type of outcome where, you know, what we, what we believe is dead wrong? Oh, totally. Totally. We see it. We see it all the time with our, with our polls where uh, customers will write back and say, Oh my goodness. The one that I swore would have won did not. Um, and you know, like, for example, we, we've had, we had an entrepreneur who was literally selling his first product and what he was trying to do, it was uh, notebooks. And what he was trying to do was figure out what two colors of notebooks to stock, right? They're probably, the manufacturer's probably giving him, uh, I think it was maybe 10 or 20 different colors, put them all on PicFu. He's like, th he said, the one, the one color that I wanted to stock, that was not the one that was picked. I picked the two that the audience went with, read all the, read all the comments, picked them you know, did great with them, right? He sold out his stock, his purchase order and so on. And so he was super happy. But yeah, we hear that we hear that from audiences all the time where they said, the one I thought was going to win for sure, didn't win. And that doesn't necessarily mean that your instincts as an entrepreneur are wrong. All that means is that it's a signal for you to go ver go validate more, right? If you really, really believe in like a certain color or something, and, and the mark, you know, and polls are telling you otherwise, well, it's still your business. But you should it's you should take it at least as a signal that you should go you should get a second or third or you know fiftieth opinion. Sure. Well, at a minimum, this informs our decision making, and that's the right. point. Is instead of us being in this kind of black hole of Bubbles. decision making, yeah. and by the way, it's kind of frustrating to have to make all these decisions without any sorts of validation, mm -hmm. uh, particularly pre-revenue validation, which is right. what I love. Right? Anything you can do to drive the the fundamentals so think of the, everything as a funnel right you start at the top you're developing the product you're bringing it forward and you're getting farther and farther down to the revenue action if we can make any of that a little easier a little more predictive on success gosh our lives are better our lives are better and more importantly it takes some of the the overhead that we have to apply to be mm -hmm. right all the time yep you know, we're exactly. not right all the time nobody is so right. why not let the actual audience, and I want to talk about your targeting a little bit, the audience who picks this stuff, it sounds like they're not just US based, but you can target Amazon Prime, you can target women. Tell us about some of the targeting because that is where the, the game could be won and lost. Right. So um, this, is a, this is a feature that we've been developing for years. We originally just started with a, with a, a panel of US based respondents, and over time, what we, what we do is that every time they come on and um, answer a poll, we ask them a couple more questions about themselves. Are you an Amazon Prime member? Do you have dogs? How often do you drink coffee? You know, um, just small things like that. And so over time, we're able to build up a demographic profile of all these different respondents. And what we've been able to do is then turn it around and allow our users, um, our customers, to target their polls only to specific segments of our panels that fit their market requirements. So one, one example, like you said, was Amazon Prime members. Um, whether or not you're an Amazon Prime member, you can target those. Um, like I mentioned, do, uh, we have a bunch of different segments. So dog owners, number of kids, you know, how do you like, do you take nutritional supplements and how often are you value conscious buyer? You know, all kinds of stuff. And a lot of times our clients our users will come to us and say hey do you have the segment and oftentimes we'll say no but that's a great segment so we'll start building that up so we're pretty flexible in terms of building that stuff up too that's fascinating uh i definitely you know i also would recommend you know as you're testing things and getting some predictive information uh at least showing you know some of the direction that the market wants you to go that testing different audiences can also have an impact, right? You can For test sure. one audience and get one answer and another audience and get a different answer. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And we've had, uh, we've had sellers who've tested broadly. So uh, our polls allow you to test between five, uh, between 50 to 500 respondents. And if it's a, let's go back to the, let's go back to the tea kettle thing. 
Uh, when you run a poll, you can run it against a general audience or a targeted audience. We've had entrepreneurs come on, run a very, very large poll to let's say 200 general population of US respondents or 500. What they'll do then is in the poll results, we break out the demographics of the people who responded. So by launching it broadly to say 500 people, then reviewing the results, they're able to see, oh, well, let's say uh, males of this income preferred option, like choice A, and females of this income preferred option B, and females under this age preferred option C. They're able to actually use that to sort of get insights into, um, you know, how different, how different demographic segments prefer different options. So then they, we've seen them actually then choose, okay, now let's run with option A and dive into that segment and do some target and run some polls and do some targeting in that segment only to sort of bubble up more insights. Well, it really does strike, you know, let's just say for the sake of discussion that you have the budget to run a few variations. Mm -hmm. Not only can you build all those variations, but you can then market, you know, using Facebook, Google, whoever, to those specific audiences, those specific products, which makes a huge conversion difference. When it comes to, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard this before where when you're selling a product, uh, they say you're supposed to just use the customer's own words to describe it. Not, not the words that you describe it, but the customer's own words. Well, we've seen, uh, we've seen sellers actually use PicFu to get our respondents to describe our product in their own words and then go and then take those written responses and use them in advertising or put that back into the listing. Because, you know, if a respondent says this is a, this is a, um, you know, a like bright red tea kettle uh, that's very stylish, They'll take it. They'll take it and put it back in. I mean, that basically they've used it. They've used PicFu for sourcing for those those kinds of comments. It really is so smart. I, I can tell uh, all the customers out there listening. So, without you know the use of the sophisticated tools like PicFu, uh, life was much harder. But we would I, I would routinely say you know the the old CEOs hitting the table uh, hand on the table, ask the customer. Stop. Uh -huh. You know, there, there's nine of us executives in the room acting like we know what's up. None of us actually know what the customer wants, but you know who does? The customer. And so right. we would send out polls, we'd send out surveys, and the, the way they would describe the product or the way they describe their uses would be language we would never use. And, and so sourcing that kind of language for any purpose, whether it's copywriting on your listing or ads or FAQs, any of it is brilliant. I love that. Um, John, who's a typical customer of PicFu? It sounds like, you know, we, we talked about the, our kind of own bias of, well, only Procter & Gamble can afford this stuff, so, you know, I, I have to take myself out. But tell us uh, who really uses this stuff. So the typical customer of PicFu is a small to medium-sized business owner um, who is um, who's basically looking for, looking for market validation for their decisions. Now, in the e-commerce space, most of, our, uh, most of our store sellers run anywhere between first-time sellers all the way up to really big corporations, um, including some of those larger CPGs that we've seen where they don't, we, we have people in the CPG corporations who they don't even want to go through the process and the time of setting up those longer, um, those longer market research surveys. So, so they'll actually come to pick Foo run their quick tests for validation and then use that to inform their decisions in their business. Oh, it's so of, smart. Yeah. So, but most of the time it is business owners or small, small to medium sized businesses uh, in e-commerce who are, um, yeah, first time, whether they're selling one product or a hundred, I mean, we've seen it all. Yeah. The fact is if you are, whether it's a bookseller, e-commerce, a marketeer, mm -hmm. you want to do any of that stuff, you want to find out some answers to questions, you can jump on to PicFu. Okay. Within a, a few minutes of setup, you're live and getting feedback. That is unprecedented. Uh, and again, just to share some of my pain points, uh, this is <laughs> like a therapy session now, John. Uh, I remember one time, so we, we had a large investment company, you know, a big venture capital company. Um, you know, they, they did huge things um yeah and they sent us to an ad agency and they're like hey we're going to do a rebrand and we're like yeah we already have a brand we got a logo we got a tagline they're like yeah we're still going to redo it and mm -hmm. the process was eighty-five thousand dollars because that was the inside special 
That was the, huh. you know, a guy and, you know, even though we're a public right. company, this is the discounted rate, 85 grand. And one of the things that they did as a part of that, and I don't remember the exact uh, dollar figure, but it's something around 15 to 20,000 of that was to put 12 people in a room as a user panel to right. talk about the use of the website and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 12 people, 15 or 20 grand worth of uh, energy and weeks and weeks of time and agreeing on questions and all this other nonsense. Yeah. But if you just took a shot at, you know, 50 or a hundred bucks at a time, you could have all of that done by the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, uh, that reminds me of a great story uh, on our end where we had, um, we had a client still, a, still a customer. They are uh, basically a private equity firm that buys up already successful Amazon businesses and then turbocharges them. And, you know, they come in with a thesis saying that we could market this better or we could read it, we could rebrand it, or we can do something better to improve this business. So we're going to buy it, change it, and hopefully reap the profits afterwards. So they're, they're a pretty large P, uh, Amazon P firm on the East coast. They come in, they bought a product. Uh, it was a, it was one of those pet odor neutralizers and their thesis, their hypothesis on this was that it's a great product. It already sells well on Amazon, but the packaging is just God awful ugly. So what they did, they went through a rebranding exercise. They, they hire, I forgot if it was in house or they hired an external team, but they basically repackaged. It was a full rebrand. They changed the bottle design. They changed the bottle color. You know, they were, they were proposing very, very large changes and they probably came up with about 20 different variations. And so in a case like in your story where they would have, you know, historically a CPG probably would have paid a bunch of money to get 12 people in a room. What they did instead is they came to pick Fu. They ran, I believe they ran four polls to 800 people total. Um, took each one took about a day or so and comparing all the different options and they had a preference they came in knowing that they had out of the 20 designs they had one rebrand that they thought would be better but you know they ran a whole bunch of them um, the audience validated that that rebrand was the right thing the right way to go um, and so that gave them the confidence to say okay well we're gonna spend fifty thousand dollars to read us up to actually put this into production uh, change the bottle color, get the special color of, or, you know, like orange plastic and bottle shape and all that stuff. So they have the, ha they have the confidence, put in the money, made those changes. And after they launched the rebrand, um, I think they added over a million dollars to their uh, run rate on Amazon. Like I love that. Double their sales right yeah. away without changing anything else. Uh, for again, the Oscars out there listening, that's not an atypical outcome when you actually have right. good information. That that's the point. Right. I mean, uh, all the stories I've just shared added up to tens of thousands, if not millions, of dollars of added value. John just gave uh, that example and other examples previously, and and in my mind, an Amazon seller or an author or a marketeer, right. if you don't take listen in any product, there's at least five decisions you could probably use some help on why not ask 50 or hundred or, you know, whatever number of people right. that you need. Uh, what do you think is statistically relevant, John? You know, I get worried about just 50, although instructive and, and additive, it may not be statistically viable on the big scale. What's your thoughts? Right. Generally we recommend uh, anywhere between hundred to 200 and then look at the split of results. Um, you know, if it's, if it's a hundred and they're evenly split 50, 50, what that probably means is that you are testing things that might be either too similar or they are too different in too many ways. Like you're testing uh, two things that are both different shapes and different colors and different, you know, so that's one of the biggest mistakes we see when people test is that they test too many changes at one time. Um, so yeah, but going back, I would say anywhere between a hundred to 200 is generally, it's the right balance of both fast and, uh, directional and a little more significant in terms of uh, the direction of the results. Yeah, I definitely, you know, I, I would suppose that the bigger the impact that maybe the more data points you want to collect. Yeah, uh, as yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I love this idea and uh, I have to tell you guys, uh, so Empowery, you know, that was the genesis was from the, the Catalyst 88 Mastermind. And we asked all the mastermind members, you know, there's 25 or 30 people in the room. We went through this big exercise. What should we call it? And what's, what's its mission and how is it going to uh, work? Nice. And, 
and it was great, but everybody wanted to call it the Catalyst 88 Cooperative. And, and we said, you know, everybody in that room, they already liked the Catalyst 88 brand and the moniker and they felt yeah. a part of it. And I said, yeah, but that only means something to us. It doesn't mean anything to the outside. So we argued about it a little bit and, but everybody was like, stand up firm. It's gotta be called Catalyst 88 Cooperative. And so I said, well, listen, uh, in that case, I didn't know about PICFU yet. This would have solved my uh, problem much faster probably. But I went on to, uh, you know, an alternative source, sure. uh, Google surveys, uh, for yeah. those who keep score at home. Mm -hmm. And we got a very clear answer in a relatively short period of time for more money than John charges, by the way. And, and it helped us see yeah. for, you know, e-commerce, small businesses, who didn't know either company name, which mm -hmm. they preferred. And it was a, it was a runaway. It was like 69% preferred the empowery name awesome. versus the catalyst 88 name. So yeah. even though each has their place for the cooperative, it's Genesis really came from this kind of uh, market, uh, you know, digital validation. And uh, I'm really excited to know more about PicFu and, and certainly I've, I've run into you and Justin at various events. You guys right. are big supporters of e-commerce entrepreneurs. And, and for mm -hmm. that, I salute you and, and really appreciate it. Um, I know that Empowery, uh, you guys are now a vetted uh, and approved vendor of Empowery. Is that true, John? Yeah, yeah. We love what you guys are doing with Empowery and, and the mission that you guys have to sort of support e-commerce entrepreneurs. So we're, we're proud supporters and vendors on Empowery. I love it. And you guys also have that same mission, right? Well, all yeah. we're doing is we're saying, how do we make lives of entrepreneurs better? And sometimes that's services, sometimes it's resources like yours, and other times it's just being able to know where to go, right? I love the idea that instead of an entrepreneur sitting out in space wondering what they do, because we all feel isolated. Uh, anybody who says they doesn't, that they don't feel isolated from time to time, they're wrong. And to, yeah. now you've got a team of people to help you make decisions over PICFU. I love that. For sure. And, and you, know, you know, Steve, like I think it was one of the things that you had mentioned like before where it's, you know, in, being in business is really all about your why. And I think that in the past, when we were running a different business, we were in business to be in business. We were in business because we wanted to be in business and we, we were doing a business that we thought, you know, could be a good business and make money. But I think now that we're, we're focused with PicFu and sort of being able to see, um, being able to see the, the value and benefit that we can bring to individuals, small businesses, small business owners, and sort of being able to see how we can help them like that. That makes that makes working on like working on pig food so much more meaningful for us. Yeah, actual fulfillment. What a yeah, concept, totally. right? Yeah, totally. no, yeah. I, I I get it. Believe me. So, um, so awesomers, you know, John talked about the the find your why a little bit, and I talk about that routinely. Uh, this is a good time to go to awesomers.com, find the little join the movement or join uh, button. The that email will send you some free stuff, including uh, mm -hmm. process how to find your why, how to write your company story, other things. All free, by the way. Uh, it's I don't know how much more free stuff I can give away, but yeah. I'll just keep going until I'm out of ideas. But awesome. you know, yeah. I, I volunteer at Empowery. Uh, I'm not a compensated person. Uh, John is not paying me to be on Awesomers. That this is not an affiliate relationship. No. We believe in stuff. We talk about it, and I can tell you firsthand we will use uh, PickFu to make decisions about products, about Empowery, about all awesome. kinds of things because it has a true value in the marketplace. Uh, John, help me, uh, if you will, I any words of wisdom, anything to help encapsulate this, uh, topic we've been talking about, you know, data market feedback, whatever you call it. Huh. Mm. I think, th I think the biggest, the biggest word of wisdom is that everyone could probably be testing more and getting value from it. Doesn't have to be big food. Just there, there's a lot of ways to validate your decisions. And I think a lot of times we, as business owners, just get something in our head and say that's got to be the way that's got to be the way i've you know we've convinced ourselves in our head that this decision that we came up with is confirmation bias right like the the absolute best decision and sometimes if we slow down just a little bit and get more feedback we can we can make more sound decisions and like you said sort of aim that rocket ship better so we can get to our eventual goal better yeah i i definitely think that is uh well said and you know, it doesn't matter, everybody, whether you're talking about your products, your photos, you know, your titles, um, even your prices, right? It's all right. relevant. Every yep. little data point is relevant. And in my book, if you can spend 50 bucks or 100 bucks to find out some of these answers and be informed, make informed decisions, 
your chance of success is much, much higher. And right. I, I love the fact that within moments you can set up something and get real time information. And I'll tell you, you know, the icing on the cake is those people typing in the answers, mm -hmm. right? Getting the votes, that's important and it's amazing. And I, when it comes in so fast, it's like a drug. But those answers that you can study later, that's where the pure gold is in my view. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's uh, good yeah. stuff. Well, listen, uh, how do we find uh, PickFu, uh, John? I, I, I know there's a website, PickFu.com. Any other, are you guys on LinkedIn or Facebook or what? Where yeah, else? yeah. So we're, uh, so there's the website where you can just, it's a self-service, it's self-service, P-I-C-K-F-U.com. Uh, we are on LinkedIn, we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook. You can contact us uh, anywhere there. Uh, and anyone, uh, any listener can contact me directly. I'm John at PickFu. Just email John at PickFu and happy to chat with anyone. I love it. Well, that's great. And don't forget, uh, Empowery uh, Co-op members, you've got a, a special insider opportunity there, and you can talk to Empowery or PickFu about that. I don't know the details, but you know, right. I, I really appreciate the fact that you guys are you know, helping the cooperative. Uh, again, as a nonprofit member on Co-op, we need vendors, we need members. Everybody's yes. got to pull their own load, right? Totally. Uh, my part, I'm a volunteer. Melissa's working uh, way below uh, minimum wage, frankly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She works uh, many, awesome. many hours. And of course, yeah. Megan and Sherry and so many others are, are doing their part. So thank you for doing your part, John. I really appreciate it. Uh, everybody check out pickfood.com. And don't forget, this is awesomers.com slash 173. That's the website, awesomers.com slash 173. We'll go put in some links and details. And maybe I could even talk uh, John into sending me a, a case study or use case or something. Absolutely. That I'll, I'll link onto the page as well. I would love to. All right. Thanks again, John, for joining us. Thanks, Steve. All right. And Awesomers, we'll see you next time. Thanks again, everybody.